intramedullary nailing with the expert tibial nail without reaming. The expert tibial nail has a new anatomic bend that makes nail insertion and extraction easier. The cannulated version enables nail insertion over a guide wire. There are several possibilities for proximal locking. Three of these locking options use cancellous bone locking screws to improve stabilization of the proximal fragment. The two mediolateral locking options enable primary compression or secondary controlled dynamization. There are four possibilities for distal locking. One oblique locking option is very distal. It allows two different interlocking directions for ideal bone purchase and prevents damage to soft tissues. There are two medial lateral options and one anteroposterior locking option for stable fixation of the distal fragment. The expert tibial nail is indicated for fractures in the tibial shaft, as well as for metaphysial and certain intraarticular fractures of both the tibial head and the pilon. These fractures are 4-1, A-2, and A-3, 4-1, C-1, and C-2, all 4-2 fractures. 4-3, A-1, A-2, and A-3. 4-3, C-1, and C-2, and combinations of these fractures. The main objectives of this presentation are to show the patient positioning, reduction, the approach and entry point, and the procedure for nailing using the expert tibial nail. The expert tibial nail can be inserted into the medullary canal either with or without reaming. In this presentation, reaming will not be demonstrated. The nail will be inserted over the guide wire. Shaft fractures will be introduced. With simple shaft fractures, four medial lateral locking screws are normally sufficient two distal and two proximal. Secondary dynamization is achieved by removing the locking screw from the static locking option. In very proximal and distal fractures, additional interlocking is required. The patient is placed in a supine position on the radiolucent table. The knee of the injured leg has to be able to be flexed at least 90 degrees to 100 degrees. The image intensifier is positioned so that visualization of the tibia, including both the proximal and distal articular surfaces, is possible in the AP and lateral views. A leg holder may be used to help for reduction, surgical approach, and insertion of the nail. The knee roller has always to be placed under the lower thigh to avoid neurovascular compromise in the popliteal fossa. The closed reduction is performed manually using axial traction under image intensification. The reduction can be temporarily fixed with reduction clamps. The required nail length must be determined after reduction of the fracture. The image intensifier is positioned for an AP or lateral X-ray of the proximal tibia. Using long forceps, the radiographic ruler is held parallel to the tibia on the lateral side of the lower leg. The ruler is placed so that its distal end is level with the required nail insertion point. The skin is marked on the lateral side. The image intensifier is moved towards the distal end of the tibia. The proximal end of the radiographic ruler is aligned with the skin marking, and an X-ray of the distal tibia is taken. The reduction is verified, and the required nail length is read from the radiographic ruler as it appears in the X-ray. The image intensifier and radiographic ruler 
are also used to establish the appropriate diameter of the nail. The entry point is decisive for the position of the expert tibial nail in the medullary canal. This position is most important for correct fragment alignment of proximal and distal metaphyseal fractures. In the AP view, the entry point is in line with the axis of the medullary canal and with the lateral tubercle of the intercondylar eminence. In the lateral view, the entry point is at the ventral edge of the tibial plateau and in line with the medullary canal. The guide wire is secured in the universal chuck with T-handle. At a 10 degree angle to the shaft axis in the lateral view, the insertion point is lightly punch marked. The guide wire is advanced approximately 8 to 10 centimeters. Its position is checked with the image intensifier in the AP and lateral views. The protection sleeve and the cutter are inserted over the guide wire and the medullary canal is opened to a depth of 8 to 10 centimeters. The guide wire and the cutter should not touch the posterior cortex. The guide wire, cutter, and protection sleeve are removed. As an alternative, the cannulated drill bit or the cannulated awl may be used. The insertion handle is directed anteriorly and the tongue of the handle is matched to the notch in the nail. The connecting screw is placed through the insertion handle and is threaded into the nail using the hexagonal screwdriver with spherical head. With the insertion handle, the nail is introduced into the medullary canal. Slight rotational movements can help the insertion. The passage of the nail across the fracture is monitored with the image intensifier in two planes to avoid malalignment and additional iatrogenic fractures. If necessary, light hammer blows may be used. The connector is secured to the insertion handle. The hammer is used in the fixed mode. If more insertion force is necessary, the hammer guide is attached to the connector and the hammer is used in the sliding mode. The final position of the nail is verified in the AP and lateral views, with the guide wire placed in the aiming arm as shown here. The insertion handle is marked in 5 mm increments, which correspond to the extensions of the end caps. This feature can be used for over-insertion of the nail or for correcting the nail length. If primary compression or secondary dynamization is planned, it's recommended to over-insert the nail up to 7 millimeters, which corresponds to the maximum distance between the positions in static and dynamic modes. Although distal locking will not be done in this exercise, it is briefly introduced here. The final nail position is checked with the image intensifier in the AP and lateral views. The steps shown are similar for proximal interlocking and will be explained later. Either 4.0 or 5.0 millimeter locking screws are used, depending on the nail diameter. Distal locking should be carried out first so that the compression mode of the nail or the backstrike technique can be used to treat diastasis. The nail must have been inserted to a sufficient depth beforehand. The nail is usually locked from the medial side, with the leg extended if possible. The aiming arm can be used for different proximal locking options. These locking options are color-coded on the aiming arm and the corresponding instruments. Three locking options, color-coded yellow, are combined with cancellous bone locking screws for ideal stabilization of the proximal fragment. Two medial lateral locking options, color-coded blue and green, 
enable primary compression, secondary controlled dynamization, or static medial-lateral proximal locking. In this exercise, static medial-lateral proximal locking is demonstrated. As alternatives, dynamic proximal locking and oblique proximal locking will also be introduced. The aiming arm is attached and a 3.2 mm guide wire inserted, as shown here. The tip of the guide wire indicates the exact proximal position of the nail in a medio-lateral view. The three-part trocar combination, consisting of the corresponding protection sleeve, drill sleeve and trocar, is inserted through the medio-lateral hole in the aiming arm. The trocar is inserted down to the bone through a stab incision and is then removed. Using the corresponding drill bit, both cortices are drilled until the tip of the drill bit just breaks through the far cortex. The drill sleeve is pressed firmly against the near cortex and the measurement is read from the calibrated drill bit. This measurement corresponds to the appropriate length of the locking screw. The drill bit and the drill sleeve are removed. As an alternative, the length of the screw can be read from the depth gauge for locking screws. The measurement is read from the shaft of the depth gauge. It corresponds to the appropriate length of the locking screw. A locking screw is inserted with the star drive screwdriver through the protection sleeve until the head of the locking screw lies against the near cortex. The tip of the locking screw should not project more than two millimeters beyond the far cortex. These steps are repeated for the second locking screw, as shown here. The end cap prevents bone ingrowth into the proximal end of the nail. Therefore, the end cap makes nail removal easier. The patient's leg should be positioned in flexion to assure that there's enough space to insert the end cap. The aiming arm, the connecting screw, and the insertion handle are removed. The end cap is inserted into the nail with the screwdriver and firmly tightened. The implant removal begins with the end cap. The star drive screwdriver is used. The extraction screw is introduced into the nail and tightened. The proximal locking screw is used to prevent rotation or displacement of the nail posteriorly, below the tibial plateau. All locking screws are removed with the star drive screwdriver and holding sleeve. The hammer guide is attached to the extraction screw. And the nail is removed with gentle hammer blows. This presentation has demonstrated the main steps for intramedullary nailing with the expert tibial nail. These steps are patient positioning, reduction, the approach and entry point, and the nailing procedure itself. Alternative A, dynamic proximal locking, primary compression. The following instruments are needed. The protection sleeve, the drill sleeve with blue and yellow markings, the trocar with blue and yellow markings, the compression screw, and the calibrated 3.2 millimeter drill bit with blue and yellow markings. In cases of diastasis, compression of the fracture gap may be necessary. The expert tibial nail allows a maximum compression of 7 millimeters. Two medial lateral locking options enable primary compression or secondary controlled dynamization. Secondary dynamization is achieved by removing the locking screw from the static locking option. To enable primary compression, the compression screw is inserted into the connecting screw until the compression screw comes in contact with the locking screw. Each complete turn of the compression screw corresponds to compression of one millimeter. At this point of the procedure, the expert tibial nail has been locked distally. 
and one proximal locking screw has been introduced in the dynamic locking option marked DYNAM. This type of locking procedure does not allow secondary dynamization of the expert tibial nail. The fracture gap is continuously checked before, during, and after the compression procedure. The second proximal locking screw is introduced into the most distal hole of the proximal locking options, marked STAT1. The compression screw is removed with the screwdriver. Alternative B, oblique proximal locking. The instruments needed are the aiming arm, whose yellow guide holes will be used, the protection sleeve, the drill sleeve with blue and yellow markings, and the calibrated 3.2 millimeter drill bit with blue and yellow markings. The proximal nail position is checked. The three-part trocar combination is inserted through the hole for oblique locking options in the aiming arm. One drill bit is inserted through the corresponding guide hole of the aiming arm. The image intensifier is positioned in the lateral view and adjusted until the drill bit and the protection sleeve are perfectly aligned, as demonstrated here on the artificial bone. The view obtained when the drill bit and the protection sleeve are perfectly aligned is exactly perpendicular to the plane formed by the nail and the insertion handle. Therefore, it shows the precise position of the proximal cancellous bone locking screw. The calibrated drill bit is inserted and the near cortex is drilled. Drilling continues and the penetration of the drill bit through the cancellous bone on the tibial head is controlled with the image intensifier. The longest possible screw should be chosen. The drill bit must not perforate the far cortex. The tibial plateau must not be damaged. The drill sleeve is pressed firmly against the near cortex and the measurement is read from the calibrated drill bit. The measurement corresponds to the appropriate length for the cancellous bone locking screw. If in doubt, a shorter screw is selected. A cancellous bone locking screw of the appropriate length is inserted through the protection sleeve. These steps are repeated for the other cancellous bone locking screws.